What was the number one car exported to the United States from China last year? Number one car from China to the United States. And you're saying there is no Chinese car on the road here, I think. Volvo. But is it Volvo or CT6? Buick and Vision. Buick and Vision number one, Volvo number two, CT Cadillacs are now imported from China too. Hey guys, welcome to Connecting the Dots, the podcast where we follow the breadcrumbs and try to predict where disruptions will take us. Having finished the research for this video, I'm sitting at my computer trying to think of how to begin this story of how GM betrayed the American people. I don't know whether to write how sad this story is or how disgraceful I think such company antics are, how disillusioned I feel as a lifelong GM fan. Or maybe I should take the EV angle and give my opinion on how this relates to GM lagging behind on EVs, while its Chinese partners are kicking butt and producing them by hundreds of thousands. So many feelings flowing at once, but instead of telling you how I feel, I'll just lay down what I know and let the facts speak for themselves. Here's the bottom line, and we'll go on from there. Everyone knows that GM was bailed out with taxpayer money. Less known is that it was similarly bailed out by its Chinese partner, SAIC, or SAIC, an automotive company owned by the People's Republic of China. But the bailout by the state-owned company didn't come free, and the terms GM agreed to resulted in the following actions. GM provided its best intellectual property to the Chinese, which made them better than GM in making cars. GM gave SAIC control of their 50-50 Chinese joint venture, and SAIC became the majority stakeholder and GM the minority one. GM shut down non-US research and manufacturing hubs such as GM Australia, GM Korea, and GM Europe. GM developed its latest new energy vehicles, meaning hybrids and EVs, in China, where they were the minority partner. And on top of it all, GM started importing Chinese cars to America. In this video, I'll be touching some highly sensitive issues. So before doing that, here's a disclaimer. The video is intended for entertainment purposes and everything presented in it is opinion only. I've tried to ensure that information provided in this video is accurate. However, I give no representation and no warranty of any kind regarding it. My analysis heavily relies on the accuracy of the sources used and on my understanding of the data they provided, so I very well could be wrong. I strive to be less wrong so in case of errors or omissions, let me know, and I'll do my best to fix them. Sorry about that, but the water will be hot. Some of the parties involved are known to be ruthless, and I don't want to find myself boiling for some stupid air. A huge thank you to my amazing patrons. I'm doing this by myself, and I truly appreciate your support. Click the link in the corner to support the channel, and you'll also get my Patreon-only newsletter where I analyze recent events to see how they'll affect companies and investments. My January newsletter showed why Tesla is not currently battery constrained and was sent to patrons a few days before Tesla's earnings call, where Elon revealed it to everyone else. Click this new link to read that email, see what value it brings you, and decide on joining my list. And if you haven't done that already, please subscribe to the channel and smash the like button to support it. It really helps the channel. Now buckle up and get ready because we're in for a wild ride. It's a story of opportunities and despair, weak morals and disruption, and one thing I promise you is that it won't be boring. I'll start with what happened and give my take on it afterwards. In 2008, a financial crisis hit America and General Motors, the nation's largest auto manufacturer, was hit hard. After years of mismanagement and spending its reserves on huge bonuses and dividends, the company accumulated huge debt and was about to default on its payments. To save the company from shutting down, in 2009, the US government awarded it $50 billion of taxpayer money. Whether the bailout was justified or not is debatable. What isn't under debate is that very few, if any, American legislators and taxpayers were aware at the time that besides being bailed out by American taxpayers, GM discreetly received another bailout, a bailout provided by a Chinese state-owned company which despite being smaller than 1% of the American bailout held terms and conditions which gave the Chinese company a distinct edge over GM. An edge which, seven years later, would quietly turn GM into the largest importer of Chinese cars into America, and which 12 years later 
would make the Chinese company the world's second largest BEV producer after Tesla, while GM is one of the laggards with little tech or sales to call its own. Zozo Go CEO Michael Dunn had worked in China for several years and observed the growth of the Chinese car industry, including GM's operations. In his book, American Wheels, Chinese Roads, The Story of General Motors in China, and in several presentations as well as regular appearances on Autoline, Michael Dunn describes the following. We want to have a car to call our own. And how are we going to get there? We're going to get there through joint ventures. We're going to invite global automakers to come into China. It'll be 50-50 by law. No foreign company can have 450%. Over time, we'll learn the technology, do it ourselves. All right? Why were the globals coming in? Why were the global automakers coming in? Do they want to give the technology to China? No, no, that's their jewels. They want the market. And the tensions that began in the early 80s still exist today. You've got Chinese wanting to secure the technology and you have foreigners wanting to secure the market. In Chinese, Tong Chuang Yi Meng, right? Okay, so, and that's the movie we've all seen, right? So China wants the tech, foreigners want the market. When China decided to grow its automobile industry many years ago, they realized they needed to get Western tech, and their way to get it was by forming joint ventures. China put huge import tariffs on imported cars, which forced any companies that wanted to succeed in the growing Chinese market to open factories in China. However, Chinese laws forbade Western car companies from opening such factories unless they had at least 50% Chinese ownership. In fact, until Tesla was permitted to fully own its Shanghai factory, all Western factories in China were 50-50 joint ventures with Chinese companies. GM's main operations in China were Shanghai GM, a JV with Sayak, the state-owned Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation. The joint ventures were hybrids in which each partner had a different focus. The Western OEMs focused on making and selling as many cars as possible, while their Chinese partners focused on getting as much of the latest technology as possible. In other words, Western companies were thinking short-term on how they could use the growing Chinese market to make an easy buck, which would push their stock even higher, while Chinese companies were long-termers, trying to grow their strengths till they get better than the Westerners and beat them at their own game. As Sandy Munro would put it, the Western companies played checkers while the Chinese played chess. Let me backpedal here, because Western OEMs weren't completely dumb or reckless. They mostly guarded their secrets, refrained from bringing their latest and best tech to China, and didn't reveal cutting-edge intellectual property to their Chinese partners. This kept the JVs lucrative for both sides, with the Chinese getting Western tech while still remaining a step or two behind. The JVs worked, and everyone was happy. And then came 2009. And there's been tension for the better part of 30 years where China has been trying to catch up on the technology through these joint ventures, but never really arrived there. As soon as they had mastered one technology, technology had moved on. Something changed, though, in 2010. This part is ancient history, so I'll run through it faster. You know the Chevy Spark and Sonic, Buick Encore GX, Chevrolet Trax and Trailblazer, and even the Chevy Bolt EV? All these are made by GM Korea, which was then called GM DAT. In 2009, GM Korea was GM's worldwide engineering and development center for small cars. Its cars sold well, but was badly hit by the recession as well as huge changes in currency exchange rates. GM's bailout was under TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which was intended for American assets only and didn't let GM use any of the relief funds to save GM Korea. Since money markets were tight-fisted with the recession, GM couldn't get any funding and they secretly approached SAIC for help and the Chinese happily lent a hand. Since both parties were secretive about the deal, it took time for the West to realize what had happened, and by the time word came out, it was already too late. By then, the American bailout was a done deal, as was GM's deal with SAIC. The first details emerged in November 2009. Word was out that GM had $491 million to spend on its Korean operations, but nobody knew where the money was from. In December, details came out that GM sold 1% of its Shanghai GM joint venture to Sayek, a golden share which made Sayek the controlling partner in the JV. Sayek paid GM 
and GM also sold SAIC 50% of its GM India operations for $350 million and let SAIC consolidate earnings for the JV, which means 100% of GM India's earnings would be considered SAIC's, not GM's. In return, SAIC also helped GM receive a $400 million loan from a Chinese bank, with GM's 49% stake in Shanghai GM put as collateral. If this sounds like a lot of money, it isn't. $85 million was mere change for a controlling share of Shanghai GM, and as time went by, more and more details surfaced on the real price GM was expected to pay for SAIC's help, a price which slowly but surely made GM shut down its global operations and build their worldwide presence around SAIC, and a price which changed the balance of power in SAIC's favor to this very day. Let's go through these prices. The first price paid was ownership of Chinese sales. The deal left SAIC as the controlling partner of Shanghai GM, but eventually GM got back its golden share. In return, GM and SAIC formed a new JV in which SAIC had a controlling stake, a sales company which would sell all of Shanghai GM's cars. Upon reading it, this seemed like a bargain. It seemed as if GM regained equal status in the main operation and only gave up control in some distribution company. But then it sunk in. Since all Shanghai GM's cars sold in China had to go through the sales company, it had monopolistic power over Shanghai GM's pricing. This doomed the manufacturing plants to work at break-even, and the sales company controlled by SAIC was where the real profit would be made. The more I dug in, things got worse. It turns out that Chinese accounting rules say that a company that has a majority control of a partnership can reflect its full earnings on its books. This means that although profit would be split between SAIC and GM, bookkeeping would show the entire profit in SAIC's finances. And that's not all. Here's what Bertel Schmidt said about this in The Truth About Cars. Even worse, GM is no longer afforded the possibility of owning the sales company outright. Chinese rules demand a joint venture for car manufacturing, but two crucial areas of the business do not need a joint venture, parts manufacturing and the selling of cars. Foreigners have quietly established fully owned parts manufacturing enterprises in China and are looking into doing the same with distribution networks. A Chinese sales company does not need a Chinese joint venture partner, let alone one that has majority control. GM is giving up control of something it could own outright in exchange for going back to a 50-50 Chinese standoff situation. But losing ownership of Chinese sales is the tip of the iceberg as the dark, cold waters of this deal hid much larger prices. Let's talk technology transfer and joint development. As we said, Western OEMs kept their cutting-edge technologies away from Chinese reach and only shared technologies with their Chinese partners when doing so wouldn't close the technological gap. Until 2009, GM did the same and kept its secrets. But from 2010 onward, they became an open book, sharing their latest technologies with SAIC and deepening the JV to include complete development and engineering of cars. They rapidly taught SAIC almost everything they knew and brought the JV to a point where the Western company's technological lead was erased and SAIC became their equal. As Michael Dunn put it, other foreign automakers are consistently taken aback by GM's apparently generous technology sharing. The open approach leaves GM vulnerable to the whims of its powerful Chinese partner. GM set an R&D center in cooperation with SAIC and assigned this center to develop their first ever dual clutch gearbox and their next generation of small ICE engines, a task previously assigned to GM Korea. GM's CEO at the time was Dan Akerson. Let's hear what he had to say. The American taxpayer rescued General Motors from bankruptcy and ruin. 80 billion tax dollars saved GM and Chrysler from going under. Did we bail out GM so it could become a Chinese company? The evidence is mounting that General Motors is becoming China Motors. General Motors has been shrinking its U.S. operations while it's aggressively expanding and investing in the People's Republic of China. This is Dan Ackerson, the current CEO of General Motors, addressing reporters in Shanghai, China in February of 2011. He was remarkably candid about the path GM has chosen after the taxpayer rescue, but few Americans know what he said. We'd better pay attention. Almost seven out of every ten automobiles, seven out of ten of our vehicles were made outside the United States. Let's think about what he just said. 
Since the taxpayer bailout, 70% of the cars and trucks produced by General Motors have been built someplace outside the United States. More and more, that someplace is the People's Republic of China. We have 11 joint ventures in China with SAIC and FAW. We're involved in vehicle manufacturing, sales, distribution, engineering design, downstream businesses such as telematics, financing, and used cars. We operate 11 assembly plants in China, four powertrain plants in eight cities across the country. We have more than 2,700 dealerships and sales outlets nationwide. Let's go back and listen to the very first thing he said in that soundbite. We have 11 joint ventures in China with SAIC and FAW. China's SAIC is the Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation. It is run by the Communist Government of China, which owns or controls most manufacturing activity, including the auto industry. FAW is another Chinese government-owned manufacturer. What this means is General Motors, the corporation saved by the government of America's democracy, has 11 joint ventures with the autocratic, anti-democracy, communist government of China. We regard our 11 joint ventures as 11 keys to success, not just in China, but globally. Our commitment to working in China, with China, for China, remains strong and focused on the future. This is a 1999 U.S. Commerce Department report on how communist China has played and manipulated U.S. corporations. It details how the Chinese extort U.S. technology and industrial know-how from our manufacturers with a vague promise of big profits to be made from China's 1.3 billion people. According to the Commerce Department report, GM beat out other prospective foreign partners with a more than $1 billion bid to produce a variation of Buick sedans with the Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation, SAIC. One of the major factors, if not the main impetus for the subsequent contract award, was GM's willingness to transfer a good deal of state-of-the-art technology. The fact that technology transfer was, indeed, the price extracted from GM for the joint venture contract is confirmed by internal GM documents. That Commerce Department report on GM and China was 13 years ago. We're now building out the Advanced Technology Center, which will bring our research and development uh, that is centered largely in the United States. We're going to diversify that more into China because we think this market is so critically important to the success of our company. That was then. This is now. We continue to invest heavily in China to ensure our long-term success. Ackerson calls China the crown jewel in the GM universe. U.S. taxpayers might wonder where that leaves the United States of America. I'm Vince Wade. GM set an R&D center in cooperation with SAIC. Here, too, I underestimated the damage this did. Sure, giving SAIC all the tech for GM's next-generation gearbox and engines seemed bad, but this was back in 2010, so it's old tech by now, and the world is moving to EVs anyway. So what does it matter, really? But just like before, the more I read and the more I analyzed, the worse it got. First, GM didn't just give SAIC their latest technology, they developed it with SAIC. This means that they actively trained SAIC engineers on how to develop cutting-edge technology. This training was priceless, as it enabled SAIC to develop its own tech later on, on cars and brands not shared with GM. Second, shifting development of small cars to China just about killed the usefulness of GM's fully-owned GM Korea. Pretty ironic, considering that trying to save this operation was what pushed GM to enter the Chinese deal. And third, oh boy, this one's a whopper. Third, GM also agreed to long-term strategic cooperation with SAIC for developing their future hybrids and EVs. To show the meaning of this, let's discuss GM's crop of EVs until 2021. The first EV that comes to mind is the Bolt. Development of this car started at GM Korea and LG in 2012 when the Chinese JV was not yet ready to start doing EVs. 
After that, the next EV that GM developed was... Yeah, you get the picture. Not a single EV developed outside of China. Another interesting fact is that even with the Bolt, GM Korea made the car like a small ICE car. It's Chevrolet Spark Twin. Anything related to batteries, battery tech, and EV technology was fully assigned to LG, not letting GM Korea gain any technological lead in EVs over SAIC. So we all thought that GM was lagging in EVs just because they wanted to make ICE cars? But there was more to that. Making EVs in China was part of their strategic plan, a plan signed in unequal terms between a financially strong SAIC and a weak and dependent GM. There is so much more to show, and I want this last section to sink in, so now's a good time to stop. We've only just started clearing this cesspool, and part two of this video will be out soon. Meanwhile, let me know in the comments below what you think. Should GM have agreed to this deal while trying to save GM Korea? How damaging do you think this was to GM and to American manufacturing? And how do you see GM's bailout by American taxpayers in light of this new data? Let me know in the comments below. I read all your comments and I really want to know. To get notified of part two, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. And if you liked this video, please smash the like button. It really helps the channel. A huge thank you to all my amazing patrons. I'm doing this by myself and I truly appreciate your support. Click the link in the corner to support the channel and to get my patron only newsletter. Finally, a huge shout out to my latest patrons, Amarnath, Martin Strilka, Jim Bob, Cyber Trucker, Peter, Johan Nell, Gort, Tony Marconi, and George Isakidis. Thanks, guys. It means a lot. Feel free to contact me and follow me on Twitter, where I am Connecting Dots. I really appreciate your being here. It means a lot. Till next time, I am Connecting the Dots, and you are amazing.